Link up, mate. We are, mate. We are live on Rugby Pass Fan Zone after week two of the Six Nations. My goodness me, what a weekend it was. I'm slightly hoarse. I've just got back from Wales. I'm back in Bonnie, not sunny Scotland. And I'm joined by my partner in crime, one of my other partners in crime, Freddie Burns. And Freddie, before we get into the Six Nations, let's just start off, mate, in the shadows of the Six Nations. Leicester versus local rivals, Northampton Saints. And man of the match is with us, Freddie Burns. Not just Freddie Burns, Freddie Burns, man of the match. Well done, mate. Cheers, mate. It was one of those, one of those days, Jim, where, you know, everything just seemed to fall right for me. Um, so no doubt next week I'll go back to about three intercepts, probably a yellow card and about four forward passes. But the chip and chase is stuck, mate. And it was a great day. At Welford Road, obviously, it's always a big game, the, the East Midlands derby. So it was good to get get the win and obviously get the bonus point as well in front of, I think it was 23,000 at Matty Only Woods, Welford Road. So, um, mate, it was a great evening and it's always nice then. She got the two days, had a few beers yesterday. It's just nice after a nice win to um, to sit back, relax and have a few beers. Where were you, Wales? Cardiff? I was, watching, I was in Cardiff, mate, tucked up in bed. Can you believe it? This is not rock and roll. Uh, I've had a busy few days travelling about and Friday, the idea was to go out with my best mucker, Kelly Brown, and paint the town blue uh, with a bit of tartan and I, I found myself in bed watching your game, watching you carve up, so I don't know whether that's good or whether it's sad, but um, I was happy I did because it's been a long couple of days. Cardiff left in a trail of destruction and we can come on to that bit, but before we do, and we've come on to the Six Nations, I want to talk about one of my ex-teammates, I'm going to call him a mate, He's a, he is a good mate, the lovable rogue, Chris Ashton, hilariously, and also played very well, but the funny bit being he got Simbin, made his debut for Leicester Tigers, his, his 15th club or something, I think it's his sixth premiership club, I mean, I don't know, I've lost count. Uh, just talk to me about the addition that he's been, Freddie, what, what's, he been allowed, what's he been like around the team? Because he's got a bit of a mixed rep, uh, and I say I love him, he's a lovable rogue, and we had a bet as well when we were at Saracens. I think we both bet our houses. But he said he'd last longer than a year. And I said he'd only last a year at too long. And we bet our houses on it. But he ain't give me his house. Which is fine because he ain't had a club. But how's he settled in? Mate, he's been, uh, he's been class. I love, I love Ash. He's sort of, um, like you say, he divides opinions um, with the supporters. But, mate, he's world class. I think he's only four tries off um, the premiership record. Uh, or, or something like that. So it was good to see him get on at the weekend, mate. Made an unbelievable try-saving tackle at a very important yeah. time in the game. And then came back on later and got yellow carded. So he took a bit of stick coming on from the Saints fans. But mate, he's a, he's a great player. And at the minute, with the internationals that we got away, um, you know, we're a bit thin on the ground in that back three with a, with a couple, of, um, couple of little niggles and stuff. So um, having someone like Ashy at the club just to be able to step in and, and Phil was unbelievable. So he's good, mate. I like him. He's somebody you could just, you know, him from uh, from your live shows, you could give him plenty of abuse. He, he takes it well. Um, yeah, he takes the banter well, mate. So he's been a good addition to the change room as well as the field. Yeah, he's a top professional as well, isn't he? Like, he's a real athlete. And I know I give him a little bit of stick on social media, but I do have a lot of time. I've got a, a soft spot in my heart for Chris Ashton, even though he trashed my jacket, my wedding jacket on a night out at Saracens. But I forgive him. I do forgive him. And he's had a tough time as well. Has, has he spoken about how tough it's been or has he just come in and got his head down? Because you look at this, this is his ch last chance saloon. And albeit he got sin binned, I think it was more of a, a team 
penalty and a team Simbin in, that he went off for. But I mean, when he came on carrying the ball, that try saving tackle. But as he mentioned, how tough it's been over the last few weeks. It's a big part of that, isn't it, as well, Freddie? Look, you know, you, you've had your issues as well, like leaving Bath and going to Japan. I was the same, you know, with Scotland and a load of other teams that I played for. It's not all glory, is it? And it's been tough for Ashu. Figures are, mate, because you're someone like Chris Ashton. In one minute, you're, you know, he scored that unbelievable try against Australia um, way back when. Obviously, he's won everything there is to win in the game with, um, with Saris. And he's just been an unbelievable player for such a long time. And then suddenly, your value kind of drops uh, for whatever reason, one man's opinion, stuff like that. And you find yourself out in the cold a little bit. And you do sort of question yourself a little bit, I'd, I'd imagine. Well, you, I have in my career, Jim, you know, even... Even at the weekend, when you get man of the match, it's just nice to have that thing of, oh, you know, I can still do it because, you know, I've sat on the bench myself this year for a, for a long time, obviously. Didn't go too well at Bath and Japan's a whole different game. So you question yourself and I think um, Ashley would be honest and say he's probably felt the same. But, you know, we're both very similar in terms of we like like having a crack and, um, and, and having a laugh. So he's coming, mate. He's been real positive. He's not spoke too much about it. I think he's just really um, thankful for the opportunity that Steve's given him and, I think he's, you know, wants to make the most of it. Um, and it's great for us, mate, as a club to have someone like that. And we've got a few young boys in the club and uh, Ashley's been there, done it, got the T-shirt. So he's a great bit of experience to have there as well. So, um, mate, he's he's class. I, I love having him around. And, you know, if he's playing and we're winning, happy days. Yeah, well, it's wicked to see on three fronts. Leicester top of the league. Chris Ashton has now seemed to have found a temporary home. Hopefully it's a long-term home. And you obviously got man of the match, like we mentioned as well. But let's stick on Leicester as we segue into the last game, uh, which was played today. Uh, England beating Italy 33-0. And the segue is around Ben Young's becoming joint most capped player, 114 caps, I think, the same as the great Jason Leonard. And then Oli Chesham as well, on the flip side of that, making his debut. Just a few lines, Freddie, I suppose, on your teammates on... Ben Young's a career that he's had. I mean, he's come through a bit of adversity, a bit of stick just to keep going. I mean, there's there's caps and then there's that many caps and then there's that many caps for one of the best teams in the world. Ben Young's, how good? And how's he still going? Mate, he is, he's generally unbelievable. To play alongside him um, at Leicester and obviously the few caps that I got had a couple of games with him at England, it, mate, he, he is... Um, He's world class, but like you say, to stay at the top for that long, over that many years, and you see the evolution of the game, you see how the game's changed, you see how the nines' role um, has changed as well, and he's constantly adapted and got better and better. And I think the main thing for me, and it's the same with with big chairs as well, is like they're just great blokes. They're good family men. There's no arrogance. There's no ego. They come in. They work hard, um, and and they've got their rewards. Obviously, chairs getting his first cap today is. Amazing. Everyone at Leicester is absolutely buzzing for him, mate, because you know, you know what it's like, Jim, you played there. He plays in a position, sort of back row, second row, where you don't get the limelight. It's not about it's not about necessarily scoring tries or being the poster boy and all that, Jim, is it? You're doing the, the nitty gritty stuff that goes unseen. And I think Ches for us this year um, has really surprised me, along with a few of the other youngsters at, at Tigers. But, you know, I know his mum... It's mum, Michelle. She's always at the game supporting his, his younger brother, Lewis, at the club as well. So um, just for his whole family and that, mate, just made up that um, he's got his, his, his England uh, debut. And obviously for Lenny and his family, for Ben Young and his family, just with what Tom's going through and stuff like that as well, for him to reach that milestone will mean a lot to the, to the Young's family. Yeah, big shout out to Ben, Tom, and like you mentioned, the whole of the Young's family. But just on Young Ollie coming on on debut, first touch of the ball was a line-out steal. Second touch of the ball was nearly another line-out steal. And his agent is my agent. So I texted him that he's out in Italy, obviously watching him, of course. It's his, his debut in Rome. And I said, like, he made a, a real big contribution. And it was it was good to see a young lad from my home club, Leicester, come on and do really well. Um, what do you make of England then, Fred? I mean, 33-0 on the scoreboard. Italy looked very physical. Um Let's ask the question about Italy first. Now, I can say this, Fred. I commentated on their Autumn Nation series against the All Blacks, yeah. Argentina, Uruguay. And they looked very good. And I say very good, they looked very physical. They looked well-drilled, well-coached. But they couldn't score. They scored a few tries in the Autumn. I can't remember. I've not got it to hand in terms of um, how many tries they scored. Against the All Blacks, they played really well. 
they made the All Blacks look average at times, but they just couldn't convert the pressure. And we saw in the game today, like they were physical in D, um, they tried things. Here's the million dollar question, Fred. How do you score tries? Why are they not scoring? Mate, I honestly, I don't know. It's a, if, if, if I'm being brutally honest, I watched that game this afternoon, it was boring. Like, England just didn't really... Like, I thought England were impressive. It was a professional win and to play away from home uh, in any Six Nations game and, and to get the um, get the win and, and to nil a team is, is unbelievable. But they didn't get out of second gear, England. They didn't have to get out of second gear. It was just an air of inevitability about it. Um, and like you say, Italy, they, they had so much endeavour. They had a little bit of creativity, the little chip early on that almost... Um, almost came off but like you say they're just not scoring tries and the minute England sort of dotted two score got two scores up you were just like right it's you you just never seen a game like really materializing so I don't know how they score tries mate I don't know what they've got to do um but as a spectacle it's boring isn't it so it's, it's, it's kind of like a bit of a flat end like to what was a great weekend of six nations rugby you want three proper test matches every time and you kind of had the two yesterday that were unbelievable to watch and then today was just a little bit of like a uh you know as a bonus point win for england do you know, do you know what i mean i don't want to sound patch no to the, no uh, the that, that's why yeah I, yeah no you're right i suppose that's why i'm chatting about this game first because when you look at the fixtures and even when you look forward and you see that ireland are up next against italy I mean, well you know it's a foregone conclusion and then what is maybe the the tightest six nations we've had for a long, long time. And they are getting tighter and tighter because we've now got, you know, five out of the six teams that are competing hard and, and, and can beat anyone on any given day. And then you've got Italy who can't. And yeah. that's just the way it, way it is now. And I say that, you know, you look that they've got Wales in the last game of the championship and you're thinking, well, if Wales are struggling and limping through this tournament, which they're now not, that could be a banana skin for Italy or Scotland, but it's just not now. And I think you look at it and you look at the interaction, we saw a few of the tweets pop up there. It's a non-starter. And I think, you know, I think I had the I had England by 28. And Italy are at home, fiercely passionate. That man, let's just talk about that man. Let's talk about some positives. He was very good today, weren't he, Fred? And, you know, there's been a lot of light shone on him and George Ford. And we spoke about it on the, on the last fan zone that we had about uh, him being pulled off in the Scotland game. He looked very comfortable today, but he was on the front foot. I think even I would have been been good at ten today on the front foot like that, would I? No, mate. Yeah, hundred percent. Like he was, he was very good today, mate. His variation was was unbelievable. His skill set was good, and sometimes I think the problem when you play Italy is that they you play certain teams that aren't of the same skill set. You can understand that certain teams with their strength and depth and the catchment areas and all this sort of thing are going to have better skill set. But you just want to see Italy kind of drag a team down into a bit of an arm wrestle and they just didn't. And, and Marcus Smith was key to that. He sort of had the ball on a string. Um, his variation, like I said, was very good. Scored another early try, kicked well. And, and if you're honest as well, I think England will be disappointed. I think it was like, um, there was a lot of handling errors out there. Um, a lot of sort of almost unforced errors, um, which England would be a bit frustrated about, but then they won, what was it? 33, 36 nil, whatever it was. So um, it's like, like England just didn't, it was like they made a mistake. It didn't really matter because they were never going to be threatened on the scoreboard. So a clinical, well, I say clinical, I've said that, but a, a professional job done by England. Um, and Marcus Smith, like I say, was at, the, was at the, the middle of that, pulling the strings. Yeah, Martin Cross, who I know, actually. Time to say goodbye to Italy. Well, this is the big thing, Fred, I suppose. Let's just talk about this before we talk about what we learned about England. The questions are always going to be there, but you did see on the Friday night that the Italian under-20s yeah. beat England in what must have been a classic. It was 6-0. And the whispers, again, I say the whispers. I was in Italy, I mentioned, commentating on the three games. Met up with Paul Gustard, my former coach at Saracens, who was England, Harlequins, and now is a defence coach for uh, Benetton Treviso. And I said, mate, what are they like? I said, because... I've played against Italy when Scotland weren't as good as they are now. And they were the toughest games in terms of the emotion and the physicality and up front. And we've seen Benetton and Zebra both struggling. But then you look last year, Benetton Treviso won the Rainbow Cup, which was an add-on of the Pro 14. 
They've been good this year. And you're hearing that they've got youngsters coming through. But at what point do you think, Fred, that they need to look at it? I don't, you know, they can't change it between now and the World Cup. You look at the championship below with the likes of Romania, Georgia. I think Portugal drew, drew with Romania or Georgia, yeah. actually. And people are like, well, we need to bring Romania up. But it's the same, the same is going to happen. Same thing is going to happen, is it not? Yeah, the problem for me is, Jim, is, is if you had that relegation from the Six Nations, you're pretty much guaranteed every year it's going to be Italy or the team that gets promoted. So therefore, no one actually gets any better. They just get exposed to getting an absolute hammering. Do you know what I mean? Um, but now Italy, I don't know how long they've been in the Six Nations for now. It's been a long, long time in it. What's it got to be? 15, 20, years, whatever it is. Yeah. So it's been a long time. It's been a long time that they've been in the um, in the Six Nations and they've never really, bar a couple of big results, they've never really challenged. So at what point do you say you've almost had your time? It's time to give uh, Georgia, a Romania, someone like that, an opportunity and put them in there. And then, But you put a team, you swap Italy out for another team, you have to give that team five years at least to try and develop. So... Do these nations then have the infrastructure and the uh, sort of people playing to actually develop and become a force within the Six Nations? Probably not. Italy are probably the, the best place team to actually build and challenge, like you said, with Benetton going how well they're going and, and having a couple of professional teams. So it's really hard, mate, isn't it? Because you're just like, there's no real answer, mate. There's there's no real, like, either way there's flaws to it. Um, you just want to see Italy just, you know, again, they're in the game today a little bit before it goes a bit pear-shaped. And last week, they threw an interception from the line-out. France score. It kind of killed the game. Today, there was a no-look pass, turnover, England score. And suddenly, you just think, right, that's the game there. It's never going to... If they could just stay, you know, if coming up to half time it's 6-0, 7-0, 10-0, whatever it is, and they're in the game, that's all you want, but... Teams are out of sight by half time, and then it just becomes a, a boring, foregone conclusion. Yeah, I think they need to give a couple of years now. I think we need to see what they're like going up and the lead up to the World Cup. Um, yeah. Kieran Crowley is doing a better job. They've got a young group of players. Michele Lamaro, the um, yeah. captain that we just saw on screens, brilliant player. Like I mentioned, the under 20s won. But again, like we're sat here, it, it wasn't even a contest, was it? I mean, it was a team, and it must have been difficult. For, for England in that game, you, you know, they're obviously trying things. It's almost too easy in terms of that mental sharpness and focus. And I think, uh, sorry, Cameron, do you think Six Nations re relegation must with Italy and Georgia would be a good way to introduce Georgia? Well, we were just chatting about that, you know, but Romania, Romania is just as good as Georgia. Yeah. So, you know, the argument could be around that. I mean, the other one to consider in this is South Africa. And there was whispers through the grapevine. They're obviously in the URC now. The time zones marry up. It, just, it would look weird for me with the yeah. romance around the Six Nations with the South Africa in that. Yeah, it would. I, I, it makes sense, but it also it just it doesn't sit right with me. Something just doesn't sit right. I actually quite like the suggestion there of maybe even having a playoff game. So you know the the bottom placed Six Nations team will play the top placed. You know whatever it, whatever the championship's called underneath. Um, European, yeah, the European, European and then the winner, and then the winner stays in. In that way, you are exposing a Georgia, a Romania, whoever it is, to a big game without, like you say, almost chucking them to the wolves. Um, is that even the same, Jim? Chuck them to the wolves, feed them to the lions. Right. Well, Whatever. either way, either way, it's not nice, is it? So, yeah, uh, well, that's what I'd say. But like you said, is you see the under twenties result at the weekend, you think there is signs of them potentially coming through and, and challenging a bit. And that's all we want. We're not expecting Italy to be top of the Six Nations in, you know, two years. But at the same time, you know, it's a shame when the games like today are just, not, they're almost like nothing games, really. Yeah, I, re I reckon give them a couple of years. I think something's going to happen. I don't know what. Well, I do know what. I think they're going to be better. So I think the yeah. next couple of years, based on the under twenties and what I've heard, and you know the limited kind of insight I've got, I just think we need to give them a bit more time. Uh, what have we learned from England, Fred, over the last couple of weeks? And obviously lost to Scotland, um, twenty points to seventeen. There was a lot of question marks around Eddie Jones, his selection, uh, how this England team play. 
And then they play against Italy. It's a foregone con- con- uh, you know, conclusion even before the game starts. So after game two, what have we learned about this England team with the fallow week that we've got leading into their next, which is a huge game for them at home against Wales, which is what, what we'll, when we'll really find out what this England team are like. Yeah, I think I, I like the way today that uh, England almost seemed to, they had the shackles off. They went to try and play. And all right, a few things didn't stick and there was a few handling errors and that, but you could see that they sort of experimented even with their selection, you know, putting Don Brandt in at eight, bringing Randall in at nine. Um, they went to go after it. I don't expect Randall to start against Wales. I expect him to go back to the more physical game. Um, but I did like the way they tried to expand and, and, and sort of play the game a bit more open um today but today was all about getting five points getting yourself on the table back in the race and like you say with the games coming up England now you know I'm not saying that you know they've got a chance they're back in it aren't they you know you you pick up five points against Italy which is you know a given but they're they're back in the race now they've bounced back from that Scotland defeat and like you say the Wales game will be the one where we know where where we're really out with England because you can't take too much from today no, you can't. Well, let's talk about Wales and Scotland. Oh, yeah. So I've been in Cardiff for the last few days. And, well, I don't know why I sound sad. It was absolutely epic. What an atmosphere there. I mean, a trail of devastation left in the streets of Cardiff. Not by me. I got out there as quickly as I could. But there was a lot of kilts lying on the floor. So I don't know. They're obviously walking around in the scud around Cardiff. Uh, but the energy, what I'm trying to say, was extremely high. Huge game, huge game for Wales. A lot of question marks, including myself. And I was chatting to Scott Quinnell before, and he convinced me that Wales were winning. He, he, we got him to do the team talk to the corporate, to the masses, about what he would say. And look, Freddie, I've played there loads. I've played at the Principality, what was the Millennium Stadium when I was playing. And it's all well and good saying Wales, oh, they're not that good. When their back's against the wall and when they're at home, they're a different animal. And again, I can only go based on a superficial attitude and understanding of the game because I, I, I watched it behind the sticks. I was doing corporate and you get a better view on TV about stuff that was happening. But my kind of snapshot from the game was it just felt like we were, Scotland were a little bit off. There was, a, there was a line break early on. Uh, the discipline was poor. Um, we weren't that great in the scrum. Uh, the discipline, yeah, there we will talk about Finn Russell uh, getting yellow carded. Line out drive. And I, I just, Wales were just better. They had the bit between the teeth. And of course they did. They got embarrassed last week against Ireland. So I think for me, it's a fall from grace for Scotland because something we spoke about, Fred, and I think we spoke about it after, they've beaten England. You know, they can get up for that game at home. It's the Calcutta Cup. We've got to be better than that now. We've got to be able to go one step further and beat teams away from home. I know we beat France last year. Wales, you know, we've not won there since 2002. And I was just disappointed. And it's easy to sit there watching with a beer in my hand. It's easy to be disappointed. I'm not there on the pitch, but I know what it's like on there. Um, what do you think of Wales Fred, obviously, Dan Bigger, a lad that you've played against, I mean, I, I know as well. Loved the bloke on his 100th test match, yeah. if you include the Lions. Um, and Jonathan Davis as well, coming on for that 100th test. You can't just rock up against Wales, can you, when they're at home? No, I thought they were, you know, obviously the roof was open, the rain was falling, and from the TV, it looked like it was a game to not have the ball. And I was really impressed with how Wales turned up physically, um, they dominated the kicking game. They obviously the driving game, that direct game was was key. And Scotland probably got sucked into play like playing the way that Wales wanted it, which was that tight, um, that tight kicking game. Obviously, there was a few key moments. I thought um, credit to Alex Cuthbert, that kick a goal that comes off the crossbar of the post, um, and he chases it and wins it. They are huge moments in the game um, for for Wales. So. I don't know how you feel, Jim. Like, uh, surely, as a, as a, with your Scottish hat on, it's a massive opportunity missed for Scotland because Wales, as much as yeah, at home they're a different force. They're always going to be tough at home. No one was expecting Scotland to go down there in and win by 15, 20 points. But after the week before and where Wales are as a squad and what Scotland were coming off the back of, surely 
it's a huge opportunity missed for Scotland to kick on and really sort of prove those doubters, you know, the people that say about inconsistencies. You know, they, they could have walked away there, not easily with a win, a hard-fought win, but they could have got out there with a win. Exactly that, Fred. And that's what I said in the lead-up. And I put my kind of name to it, I suppose. And I thought Scotland were going to win. A lot of people did. Uh, I remember a few years ago, John Barkley was, was captain at the time. First game of the championship. And same thing, I think it was four years ago. Oh, Scotland are going to win this. Wales are struggling. And they hammered us. Yeah. And we were embarrassed. We weren't embarrassed yesterday. But I think it was that, what you just said then. I think Cuthbert's chase um, for the kick off the post, that kind of summed it up. They were just to the ball a bit quicker. And yeah. they were just that little bit more physical, that little bit more accurate. There was nothing in it. The game, well, it couldn't have gone either way. Wales looked comfortable yeah. for the majority of it. They did. And I think the big standout moment was was Finn Russell getting yellow carded, you know, with 12 minutes to go in the game. And look, I love Finn. I'm good mates with Finn. Um, I'm one of his biggest fans as a player, but, you know, the discipline thing now is becoming a bit of an issue. You know, he got yellow carded last year against England, got red carded against France, went on to win them games. And it's kind of caught up with him a little bit and the team a little bit. And Fred, you'll know, like you've been for it. And who am I to talk about penalties and yellow cards, really, in the grand scheme of things with my history? He goes for the intercept. Yes, he gets bumped. And he knows what he's doing because... You know, sometimes you see players get away with them, Fred, don't you? They almost go yeah. for the intercept and tackle at the same yeah. time and they and they get the ball, uh, sorry, and they hit the ball and goes forward and it's in the act of tackling. Wales potentially could have scored off that. I know we didn't look at it and there was a load of stuff happening around the referee. He didn't want to check it, he wanted to check the ground in. Um, but yeah, it, it's tough, isn't it, Fred? I mean, I don't know, when you lose your 10, especially at that moment in such a tight game, it's going to be tough for Scotland, isn't it? Especially someone like Finn Russell, who is, well, it's obvious, isn't it? He's integral to Scotland. Yeah, it's more um, like Finn Russell's a player, you know, with probably similar attitude to the game where you kind of live and die by the sword. Do you know what I mean? He picks that intercept off and relieves pressure or runs the length and scores. Everyone's like, wow, Finn Russell. But I think... It's one thing to have a 10 Simbin. It's obviously tough because he controls the game. And um, But like you said, it's another thing when it's in Russell in that Scotland team because he is paramount to everything that's good about that. He just, when he's on, he just keeps them ticking over. You know, you've seen the week before against England, the double cross field kick. He, it's his, he was kicking his, his penalty goals. Um, so when you lose him, the message it kind of gives to the rest of the team is we're in a bit of trouble here now. Like, do you know what I mean? Um, but I thought, like you say, it's, it's such a tough one because you never want Finn to curb his enthusiasm. But as you said, once you start racking up a bit of a record of disciplinary issues, you're kind of leaving your team um, in, in the mess, to, to want of a better word. Um, so, yeah, so he needs to, I guess it was something that will be addressed, but he brings so much to that team, you don't want to take it away from him. But it's... Um, it's definitely a huge moment in the game with what, like you said, 12 minutes to go, losing your 10, your talisman. Um, it's never any good, but they didn't. There are too many turnovers, Scotland, I felt, you know, and that's credit to the Welsh defence and the way they went out. Um, and again, they lost the kicking battle for me in the majority of the game. And on a wet day, that's the one battle you probably need to win. Well, the two battles is the physicality battle and then the kicking battle. Um, and credit to Wales, they, they won both and ended up Sneaking away with the win, but I was surprised, Jim, that they didn't take the, they didn't go for the point. Were you? Yeah, I was a little bit. Yeah, I mean, in those conditions. Yeah, it was the flip flip to last week when they played when Scotland played England and England went for the corner. Yeah. You know, and it's one of them where yeah, I suppose you get a feeling for it. I mean, it was the same as Wales. Wales didn't take the points, did they? And they kept and they kept banging to the corner, and then bigger yeah. ended up taking the drop goal, oh, yeah. which at the time. I was like, well, why would you take the drop goal when you've been yeah. going for seven points? And you could see the Welsh confusion around it. But actually, that's what won them the game in the end. Yeah. So, look, Freddie, you know better than me. I've been retired four years now, mate. So, it, 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 it's a feel, isn't it? It's easy, again, yeah. stood there with a pint in your hand saying, oh, yeah, you know, yeah. should, should, should have took the points. I don't think the weather, what we saw on TV and looking back at a few highlights, kind of did it justice. It was, it was wet. Uh, and there was a little bit of wind. But just, I suppose, on Dan Bigger, let's talk yeah. about him. I mean, on his 100th cap, 
captain, would have been a tough week against what this week having been beaten by Ireland. And you just saw, I mean, he's just an absolute warrior. And to take that drop goal, uh, how he did and have the confidence and also to make the decision to take that drop goal and win Wales the game. Um, big game player and he rose to the occasion. Yeah, I think, you know, any player now who plays 100 games, they, they get there because they're bloody good and, and he is a very good player. Um, again, the whole drop goal thing was was a weird one because, like I said, I thought um, they could have taken like taken the points earlier, especially in those conditions, is just get the lead and then they were kicking well, their mall was going well and sort of take control of the game there. Um, but like you said, it was the right thing to do to take the drop goal. There was a bit of confusion around it, but got the win. Um, and like I said, I, I hope this comes across right or I word it right, but it was like, it was a bigger, it would have been a bigger loss than it was a win, if that makes sense. So if Scotland losing that, suddenly they go back to being inconsistent Scotland, missing opportunity. If Wales had lost that game, suddenly everyone's going, wow, Wales are in a lot of trouble here. They got humped by Ireland and now they've lost at home to Scotland. So the fact that they got that win now, obviously they've got two weeks now before they go, who they got England at Twickenham. You know, if they were going to Twickenham, having lost to Ireland and to Scotland at home, it could it could be a bloodbath, couldn't it? But instead, yeah. they've ground out the win and this next two-week period, they'll be looking at England, licking their lips, eyeing it up and thinking, right, we could go to Twickenham where they've gone all right there in recent years and some big games, haven't they, in the World Cup and stuff like that. So um, it's a place that they'll want to go and they'll be looking at that game to, to now kick on and show that they are better than just sort of scraping through at home in the wet, but going there and, and putting in a real good performance. And that's the thing about this Welsh team. Like I was trying to contextualise what it's like playing there. We're talking about one of the proudest nations in the world. Rugby, yeah. number one sport. You know, that stadium, the atmosphere there is just unbelievable. And a team like Wales, when their backs are against the wall, like I just look back, even in Gatlin's era, where we we're like, oh, Wales are going to struggle this year, aren't they? Grand Slam, World yeah. Cup. They get to the semi-final against South Africa with half a team. Didn't train all week, apparently. You're like, well, South Africa, going to smash them, are they? And they nearly beat South Africa last year. Oh, this isn't just me. People think it's just like I have this thing around Wales. This is us looking at things, looking at the regions, looking at the form yeah. of the players. And we're thinking this year, our oh, regions are struggling. Didn't win a game in Europe. We, we spoke about it after week one. And you're like, well, OK. They're, 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 they're no Ken Owens, no Alan Wynne Jones, no Lydia, no Tipperick, you know, no Halfpenny, no strength in depth, and then no George North, no Navidi. So you're thinking, well, they're going to struggle. Yeah. And that's actually when they show what they're about. And, you, you know, I tweeted about it. I said, like, fair play to Wales, the better team won. And you cannot ever question the desire of that team. But then I look at Scotland and someone stopped me in the street and it's like, well, you know, where does Scotland go now? Well, the obvious one is, is well, they've got to keep moving forward. They've got France, they've got France at home. Now, if you look at the history books over the last two years, we beat France twice yeah. in a row. First, uh, you know, two years ago, just before COVID hit, it was that game against France and then COVID hit and then we got locked up for two years. We beat France at home. And then last year, with no fans, with 14 men because Finn got sent off, we beat France. Can you believe yeah. it? Um, so... But it's going to be a hell of a championship now, isn't it? Like, it's just, it's the, the fixtures and where teams have got to go and play is is unbelievable. I just felt the one thing that stood out yesterday, Jim, and obviously you being there, I bet it was incredible, was the anthems, mate. When that Welsh anthem was being sung on the TV, it, you can't not have the airs on the back of your neck standing up. It was unbelievable to see them back at the Principality with like a full house. All right, the roof was open. Um, but still, mate, that atmosphere just looked unbelievable. And as a player, you're always going to run through a brick wall when that's behind you, aren't you? Exactly. And that was it. You know, that was it. Like, listen to Scott Quinnell, and he thought Scotland were going to win. Yeah. But he said, you'll know. When the anthems are done, like, you'll just get, you'll get a kind of, you'll just get that feeling. And that was it. You, you could just, as soon as the anthem was done and the flames go up, I'm like, oh, shit. Yeah. You know, like, I'm thinking it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough. We knew it was going to be tough, but... Just on, on Scotland, where do they go from here? Well, they've got France. It, it's going to be tough because how do you measure success for them in this championship? 
when I, I think they have to win an away game with uh, no disrespect, one of the bigger teams. I know we beat France last year, we beat England, and then we beat Italy and lost the, the couple and we finished fourth. You know, I felt that we had to beat Wales and then that momentum taking us into the France game and then we've got Italy and then it would have been Ireland last up who looked phenomenal. So yeah. I don't really know. I need to watch the game back properly to kind of digest it, but I'm a bit dejected. And, and look, I'm only a little bit down because I thought we were going to win and because I yeah. genuinely believe that this is a once-in-a-generation team that everyone keeps speaking about. You know, I thought Darcy Graham was... Oh, that's finished. Unbelievable, wasn't it? Yeah, unbelievable. You know, the, the, the tackle there as well. Yeah. I mean, on the uh, Davidson, Jack Morgan. And yeah, I, I, that was the thing. I think it was just, I just left. I was just like, just a bit flat. But look, it wasn't through lack of trying. And it yeah. opens up the tournament, as you said. But let's talk about the game of the weekend, uh, which lived up to everything we hoped for. It was a close game. Uh, the physicality in Paris, France versus Ireland, the two favourites of the tournament. We knew it was going to be tight. And then you look at the game early on, 22 points to seven to France. You're, you're thinking, well, actually, yeah. Ireland could be getting hammered here. I don't know how, but France. My, let's start on them. My goodness me. And I tweeted about it as well. Of course, I did try and get my followers up. The Their ability around plays off nine, the forwards coming down them channels, just the confidence of the line. And we know for, we know the French have got that anyway. We know the Jouet parts of that and they take risks. But they're just comfortable and they're big and they're powerful and they're fit. Before we talk about Ireland coming back, let's just talk about how good France looked in that kind of first half. Yeah, they started the game unbelievable, didn't they? That tempo. And then when you've got DuPont and Intermaco, who just seem to be sort of telepathic with each other, that... That almost ridiculous offload from Intermac inside to like no one, and then the point just arrives. Like what a start to the game! But for me, the thing that stood out for for me with the, with the French was the defensive line speed. I think you can see Sean Edwards's input in there coming through now. Um, the week before Ireland were allowed to play, they had short passes, long passes, forwards carrying, forwards tipping. France just took that away from them and, and forced the likes of Bundiaki back inside, forced a load of errors. And that's where Ireland sort of struggled. And we know what France are like. Unbelievable team on the counter-attack, on turnover ball. Um, and just they're all around attacking games, though. They started the game well, but everyone will talk about them scoring tries and obviously going 22-7 uh, up or whatever. But um, for me, it was all around the defence. That's the thing that was impressed me the most. Um, the line speed, the physicality, and the pressure that they put on Ireland to stop them from playing the way they did against Wales the week before, I thought was outstanding. So with defence, Freddie, and you're probably best placed than anyone to talk about this because you look at the shift in mindset and what's happened at Leicester with uh, Sinfield coming in and everyone's speaking about Sean Edwards and, and what he's brought and we don't really know, we're kind of guessing, but we kind of do know because you're watching it unfold. Like how out of everything, about, out of attack and defence... Surely defence is the most easiest one to solve, Freddie, is it? Because, again, we were chatting about Italy. Their defence looks good. They look physical. Albeit they, scored the, they, they had 33 points scored against them. France, their big shift has been their defence, but their attack looks phenomenal as well. Out of the two, what's the easiest one to change? Um, I'd say, like, defence... Like def you know, Jim, it's not changed that much since you retired, mate. Defence defense should be simple. You know, and, and hang on, let's get one thing straight as well. I'm a fly half who's probably who misses a fair amount of tackles talking about defence. So I'm not sitting here saying I'm a I'm a defensive guru, but um defence is the one and, and defence is very attitude. It's all about your attitude, so wanting to get in the way, get off the line, um, work hard for each other. Um and France showed that in abundance. So yeah, defence should be a relatively simple fix. I think the main thing is is the buy-in. And I think with someone like Sean Edwards, obviously being at Wales and then going to France. And I know he, he did that interview a year or so ago where he's trying to speak the language and all that sort of stuff. Um, for him to get a buy-in from those French players as a bloke. So at Leicester with Kevin Sinfield, you just look at what the bloke does off the pitch and how he is as a man around the place. And he's a bloke that you want to go to war for. Do you know what I mean? Like you would do anything for. And I think that's the main thing. And there's a belief in this French team as well that they 
look after each other. You saw the celebrations. You see the pictures now. You saw the celebrations at the final whistle. Like they're all in it together, and that cohesiveness and that sort of one unit in defence is is huge. Um, and they'll work hard for each other. So technically, it probably should be the easiest fit, but also it's probably the first thing to to slip if there isn't a buy-in or there's you know any um, yeah, there's not a buy-in from the players. I know there's cliques or there's unsettledness in the in the camp. Defence is where you'll see it. And I just think that French team yesterday, they all bought in. Ireland was smart that in the second half, sort of attacked a bit narrower. Obviously, Jameson Gibson-Parks try sort of sniping, quick ball, picking off the, the heavier forwards. But they really took away that, that wide game that Ireland played against Wales and sort of forced them in that first half, especially um, back inside. And then obviously, fair play to Ireland though, mate. I know we've gone on a bit now, but they found a way back into that game and that's a sign of a good team. Um, and, you know, all comes down again, we, we talk about it, is, is decisions around penalties and you're all outcome-based, don't you, Jim? So that decision, I think, was about 73, 74 minutes for the, uh, for the penalty where they went for goal. You know, you can argue that should they have stuck it in the corner. Um, What's your thoughts on that, Jim? What would you have done as a, as a captain? I know, again, it's, easy to, it's so easy to sit here and be like, ah, oh, they went for the post and then they lost, so they should have gone for the corner. But Yeah, mate, it, 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 is, it is so tough. You're away from home, obviously with the bonus points and stuff, and Andy Farrell mentioned it, didn't he, after the game? They got a point out of a game in which looked like it was completely gone. Yeah. It's tough, isn't it? it and again, I'm not, it, it is. I mean, look... <laughs> Not that I'm putting myself in the same position as James Ryan or a Dan Bigger going into the game or that man, Andrew DuPont, making these big decisions on the pitch. But in hindsight, you you know, would you have wanted to go out on your sword as he'd gone to the corner and, and it not materialised? You know, if they got the five points, it's still obviously not the six to draw it or the seven to win it. So I suppose you, you've got these things going on as well. But I think what we did see around... The, uh, so I'm just reading the comments. Fair play to all yeah. those people who waited until full time. She just Ireland shouldn't have kicked for the post. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's the you know, it, it's easy. It's easy to sit there and judge and say you should have, could have, would have. Is that now Tracy the player? I don't know. Is it the journalist? Anyway, um, but it, I think it showed us from Ireland to come back from that deficit, what they're all about. And you've got two yeah. very similar teams. The way that they play, uh, how their forwards carry, so powerful. You mentioned James and Gibson Park as well. Anton Dupont in and around the breakdowns there. Um, and with Ireland, again, in the lead-up to the game, the big question was going to be around Johnny Sexton not being fit. Yeah. And could Joey Carberry fill that void? And if Ireland didn't win, it's because Sexton wasn't there. If Ireland got hammered, it's because Sexton wasn't there. But actually, we know Ireland didn't win, but they came close. They looked very good. And, you know, Andy Farrell mentioned it as well, a reference Joey Carberry. How impressed were you with him? Because I think you can say this being the brother of Billy Burns. You're almost damned if you do, you're damned if you don't, if you're playing for Ireland at 10 and you're not Johnny Sexton. Yeah, mate, it's um, it's big, big boots to fill, isn't it? Um, and they haven't found that predecessor yet. You know, I was one of them and I'm going to say it because obviously my little brother's a flat. I always saw Carberry more as a fullback. I thought he was, uh, like when I've seen him, I thought he looked good at, at fullback. That said, I thought um, yesterday, I thought he had a, had a great game and, the guy's had his injury problems, so it's a huge credit to him to even get back and be in that international reckoning off the back of some of the injuries that, that he's had and the setbacks he's had over a, over a period of time. Um, and especially in that test match environment, yes, you have to deliver straight away, and he did, but he'll only get better and better with the more game time he plays at 10 in the national rugby. So Sexton is in a class of his own, we know that, um, but whoever they want to, you know, um, succeed Johnny Sexton needs to be given time and not judged on one game and I thought um, I thought Carberry yesterday was a great starting point for him and obviously found a way back into the game when they could have capitulated and uh, everyone would be blaming it on on the fact that Sexton wasn't there so there's a lot of pressure on him there's a lot of pressure on whoever wears that 10 shirt for Ireland if it's not Johnny Sexton um, but uh, Carberry should be very happy with the way um, the way he played but um, yeah, as you see from the comments there, I, from my armchair, I would, I wanted them to go to the corner and just go for the win. But like I said, when you're sat there watching it in a pub with a pint in your hand and you're not on the pitch, it's, it's two different things. So, uh, either way, 
it's a tough call. You, you live and die by the sword and, and Ireland went for the points and then didn't didn't get back into the, uh, uh, didn't give themselves an opportunity to win it. So you sit there and you say, oh, they should have gone to the corner. But I would have liked to have seen them go to the corner, Jim. Yeah, absolutely. And then, do you think the wind's been taken out of the Irish sails or not? Or do you think it's actually been beneficial for them? I know they didn't win, but in terms of their performance, because all the talk has been about Ireland and France because they beat the All Blacks. But to come within six points of, you know, one of the best French teams that we've seen, you know, Bundiaki, Matt Hansen, you know, we've we mentioned Carberry there, Jameson Gibson Park, whatever back row the Irish put out, the way that their front five play, um, you know, Andy Farrell looks happy. And I know it's a weird thing to say, but he looks happy with performance because that's what they look at, don't they? Sometimes you'll perform well and you don't win. And I think when you're talking about the top five teams in the world, that's generally what it is. You need a balance of the ball, the decision to take the penalty or to go to the post, yellow cards, these small inches in the game that make the big difference. But Andy Farrell looked happy after the game in terms of how they played. And that probably takes us forward into the rest of the tournament. How does France lose it? And Ireland, you know, can they come through and win it, do you think? Villiers there, I mean, wow, what a player he is there. Goodness me. Yeah. Um, what, a, what a star. But how do France lose this? Do you think they've got it in them, Fred, or not, to, 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 to slip up in one of the games? I mean, the big game's coming up for them. I'll say it. Scotland at Murrayfield. They lost two years ago. Uh, we beat them last year. Not that that's anything to go by when you look at how good they are now. And then obviously England in Paris as well. So where did this French team slip up, if at all? Um, it's hard, mate, because like, I don't really... Um, like yesterday, I didn't. I, I wouldn't say Ireland like, slipped up in that game. I thought, uh, I think Andy Farrell was happy because yesterday was a great learning experience for that Irish team. The week before, they had it all their own way. Um, the way they played, unbelievable to watch. And then yesterday, like I said, the French defence took like took the yards, forced them back inside. So now I think Andy Farrell would have been happy with the fact that they found a way to get back in the game by adapting their game plan a little bit and playing a little bit narrower and sniping around the breaks rather than that expansive game that we saw against Wales. Um, as for France losing it, God, you just don't know, Jim, because there's such... Mate, it's going to be an unbelievable tournament now for the... You know, that France, as much as they'll be confident after two wins and obviously a good win... Um, yesterday, in the back of their minds, they will know that they've lost the last two games against Scotland and potential bogey team. And we know that Scotland can turn up on any given day and, and do a job. So, mate, it's, I'll go to Jim, it's hard to call. Like, France are my favourites from the start to, to, to win it. And if anyone was going to get it, go Grand Slam. But I think I said last week, I don't think any team will win the Grand Slam. So, I'm not, I see I see France, I do see France potentially slipping up. Um whether that's them underperforming at Scotland. You know, all it takes is to rock up at a, at a wet Murrayfield gym or it'd be a windy day and France not being able to shift that ball quite like they like, like, they like. and yeah, it'll be interesting. So I think, um, I think I, I agree with that comment. I think France will win it. It just, man, I don't know. I just can't call these games, Jim. They're so tight. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, I, 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 I reckon France will grow summit now. I saw enough in their game yesterday and understand that Ireland, who I think are a little bit undercooked because, and I say that because it's, it's been too easy for them. Leinster yeah. put 30, 40, 50, 60 points on teams. 70 points was it on Bath or whatever it was. Yeah. It's just, it's too easy for them. So I just feel that, that at the highest level, they're slightly undercooked. We've seen that with Leinster. I think when France get it right, so if France play Scotland, and France are 100%, Scotland are 100%, we don't yeah. win. Scotland don't win. England don't yeah. win. And that's yeah, the thing. Yeah. I think. I think they. I think they. They can even have a five percent drop off because you look at the pond. Some of them passes into the wide channel, and that's the big question. How do you beat these defenses now that come up hard and you take risks? You mentioned. You mentioned Intermax pass on the inside. I mean, I don't see any player doing that. I don't yeah. see anyone else doing that in the tournament. And I think I look at the way the forwards are coming. Villanza, uh, Cyril Bai coming down there. Mashan. I mean, the Wookie. Everyone. I mean, yeah. I just. Yeah. And I look at that team and I'm like, they've got the World Cup in two years. The profile of the players, how fit they look, the defence of Sean Edwards, the fact that they played that game against Ireland and it was tough. There's a week off. I see France going all the way now. Um, yeah. I really do. So I want you, 
you're going to say France are going to win it, but you think they might lose one. I'm going to go France Grand Slam, right? Yeah, all right, mate, we'll do that. What we put on it? Um, I don't know. We can decide. All right, we'll, we'll have Sorry. a little think. But one thing yeah. I want to touch on, Jim, how about that Matt Hansen try, mate, from the restart? My goodness me. Well, I mean, where does he come from? Return like, of the you, Mac. You know, you know as well, mate. So just to touch back on it, that pass from into Mac to Dupont, you are like, it's one of those things, mate. I don't think you can even be angry if you're a defence coach. It's like one of those things that you just like, where the hell? He's just thrown it into a bit of space and he's got it. Then you're under the post, Jim, and you've been there as a captain. I've been there with you, mate, in our cluster days when a team scored early on and you're looking around and everyone's looking a bit shell-shocked and you're thinking, Jesus, how are we going to get back in this game? Obviously, I know they kicked the penalty afterwards, sorry, but when the penalty's there, you're thinking, Jesus, 10-0, we're going to, we're, we're up against it here in France after, what, six minutes? And you're thinking, right, how are we getting back into this? And there you go, great restart from from Carberry and Blumen, return of the Mac, Big Mac was Blumen there, just picked it off and straight over and you think, oh, here we are, I'm back in the game now, lovely. Do you know what I mean? It's an like unbelievable try. I love to see it. Well, that's what I mean. And that's what Ireland have got now. As, as well as, they, you know, they, they've always had a bit of structure and physicality, but they've got the ability to, to pull rabbits out of the hats now. And, you know, that's what's making this tournament so good. Freddie, before we go, let's just look at the week three predictions. So England versus Wales. Who are you going for at Twickenham? I'm, I'm going to go England. England. I think England will win that. Um, I think you'll Manu's see. Back. Manu's back yeah. as well, isn't he, for sale, carving up. Again. Yeah, yeah. So I think I think you'll see Manu back in there. I think, um, yeah. I just I, I just see England winning that. I think England will go will go and win that. That's all. Yeah, centre yeah. centres where they look a little bit like, as in, yeah, yeah. I'll say it. And they mentioned it. I think Nick Mullins threw a ridiculous stat out there. I don't know what it was. It was a high number of uh, centre partnerships that they England have had since the World Cup, it seems to be the one position where they're struggling. And the big part of that is, is Manu being injured, oh, yeah, is yeah. it? So yeah. I think, I you think know, when, he's fit, back in. when he's fit, he's, no, he's best in the world. You know, ridiculous. He, he he looks looks ridiculous. That, like last week with that, with Esther Hazen, do you know what I mean? How good's he been? And then Manu literally comes straight back from injury and Blumen writes him off and suddenly like, that's what he can do. So yeah, mate, Manu comes back in and you think he gives you that go forward and then you're getting quick ball for a, Ben Young's a Randall to a Smith and suddenly the game starts opening up a little bit. Um, but yeah, I think England for that game, Jim. All right then. Um, Ireland, Italy, how much? I reckon it, Italy by 10. No, checking. <laughs> After what we said. Mate, I, it could be, that could be a massacre. Um, it could be, I, it could be Ireland by 35, mate. Yeah. And that's the big thing again for Ireland. So off the back of that, they play, they have a week off and then they play Italy and then a week off so that's where I think I, I just look at the run, the run for them. Yeah. I mean, and you know, I think, you know, they've obviously got England to play as well. Uh, anyway, we don't want to ruin all the content that we're going to have going forward. And then Scotland, France. Do you think France, th imagine three times in a row, Scotland beat the French who could go on and win the World Cup. That man, Finn Russell, against his teammates at Racing 92. Because he, look, he knows he needs to turn up. He knows he's been driving yeah. around in a Rolls Royce in Edinburgh this week. Um, then lost to Wales and, you know, he, he's, he's going to go back to Paris and he's going to want to turn up. You know what I mean? He's going to be under a little bit of pressure and a, a Finn Russell under pressure is a good thing. Yeah. So, do you think Scotland can beat France? I think, that, mate, I'll be honest with you, that's the one that I'd struggle to call. I like, I, I, I fully agree with what you said, Jim, whereas if they both rock up and are on their game, there's one winner and that's France. However... Like, that's the only thing now is I thought it was a good test yesterday for France, but there's still, there's just that little bit that we need to find out about them. And I think that game will be whether, we, we'll find out a lot about France at the end of that game. If they go there and, and, and win that game, I think suddenly people start going, we will start talking about them for, not I know they already are, but for, you know, winning World Cups in 80 months and, and stuff like that. So um, it'll be a big, big question mark around that one, mate. We'll find out a lot from that game, but I think France. All right. Do I say it? Say it, Jim. I'll just, I'll, I'll just say Scotland for now. But I, I don't, that, that's me heart saying that. My head saying France. I think what I saw against Ireland, they look good. So I just m mumbled it there. Um, okay. Freddie Burns, thank you again. Mate, 55 mm -hmm. minutes has absolutely flown by. And thanks for the comments. Keep sending them in. Keep them nice. But keep them opinionated. We like that on Rugby Pass. 
fan zone and tune in after week three. And like Freddie said, that's when we'll know whether France will be on for a Grand Slam, whether Italy can score tries and actually how good are this English team against um, a Welsh team that have bounced back against Scotland in Cardiff. I'm a little bit hoarse. I've enjoyed my weekend. Freddie Burns, man of the match. Who have you got this week, Fred? Bath at the rec, mate, on Saturday. Oh, he's going home. He's yeah, going home. It's a big one, mate. It'll be good fun. Yeah, so good luck, uh, Freddie, good luck. next weekend against Bath. I'm going to have a chilled week this week. But big thank you to everyone who's watched, who interacts with Rugby Pass and our Fan Zone page. Jim Hamilton, Freddie Burns, over and out. Mm-hmm.